a wonderful day to be inside here in Greater Detroit. And we welcome you inside Taylor Lanes in Taylor, Michigan, for the second event in the PBA six event versatility swing. This is your Chameleon Championship. Glad you're spending part of your Sunday with us. Rob Stone, Randy Peterson with you. And over the course of the last few weeks, we've used the term bonus bowling. Two weeks ago, it was the women. Last week, it was the seniors. This week, literally, there is bonus bowling due to a major scoring malfunction earlier in the week. Originally, this tournament was slated to be a three-match three men's finals, but because of a huge computer scoring error, the integrity of the tournament was threatened. So an executive decision was made to add another match featuring Mike Machuga and Sean Rash. So today, the fans at home, they get a bonus match. More bowling for the same low, low price. We're working to work just as hard, man. Bonus work for us. So we begin with Sean Rash taking on Mike Machuga. This is going to be a great matchup to start. The Cranker versus the Pure Stroker. Mike Machuga looking for a second career title. And the winner of that one will take on Brian Kretzer, the big Buckeye fan. He's in enemy territory this week. He's seeking his first title if he is to win. The big nasty, Wes Malott, would be next up in his grill. And Wes Malott off to a great start this season. But your number one seed is Bill O'Neill. Bill O'Neill making back-to-back -back shows for the first time in his career and his second last week to Walter Ray Williams Jr. And we conclude with the second PBA Women's Series event of the season. Michelle Feldman with her second crack at a title this season. Take a look at our stepladder format. And number one seed, Bill O'Neill, perhaps the most accomplished PBA bowler without a title yet. And we begin with Mike Machuga, just one career Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour title. It came in 2005, the Greater Omaha Classic, and it just happened to be rolled on this very same chameleon oil pattern. Hmm, I see a trend. Maybe, perhaps, we're onto something. He celebrated that win with the now famous Machuga flop. Can't wait to see it again. Long ways away from that. Ooh, danced on that gutter for a long time, Randy. And we'll get into the oil pattern later, but you're not supposed to play the outside part of the lane on the chameleon pattern. Trying to calm himself down. His best finish last year was fifth at the Atomic Championship in Cheektowaga, just outside of Buffalo. Great pickup. Saves face. That's how it's done, man. You can't draw it up any better than that. Get the one over into the 10. The ball will take out the two and the four. And Mike Machuga avoids the early open frame. So up now, young Sean Rash, after starting his career 7-0 on television, he lost to Norm Duke in the first semifinal match of this season's first event, the PBA World Championship. How about that break? Trip 2-8-10 to start. And who can forget the last time we saw Sean Rash on television as we take a look. Now this is where you're supposed to play on the chameleon pattern, that deep inside line. But last time Sean Rash was on television, he accrued $2,100 in shot clock violation fines. Told us a couple distractions, had bad footing all week, and admitted it's still in his head a little bit. Oof, Brooklyn. Opportunity as that one went left of the head pin. Using two different bowling balls. One on the right lane, one on the left lane. So obviously for Sean Rash, not the same ball reaction. That's going to be straight and hard at the six. So Rash starts strike spare. The 26-year-old native of Wichita, Kansas takes a seat. And Machuga from Erie, Pennsylvania, steps up. And a washout spare in the first. Washout, I like that. You're getting so good, Rob. Depends who you ask. And one of the perks of the season for Machuga, his health is finally in order. Healthy and strong as I've ever been in my 
in my career, and and uh, all my little tick tricks and tools are starting to come back, and I feel pretty sharp. So I'm looking forward to uh, to a good season. Two years ago was a groin injury. Last year, hernia surgery. Both of those coming about three weeks before the season started. And you can see right off the bat, no matter if you're playing the outside part of the lane or in, that this oil pattern is very touchy. It was the second lowest scoring pattern that we had all of last season. And not a lot of margin for error out on the lanes thus far. So another solid spare pickup for Machuga. Rash steps up in the third. He has gone strike spare as we take a look at how Sean Rash qualified this week for the Chameleon Championship. Another ball change, and that ball looked like a piece of charcoal. A lot of surface on it, very aggressive. And he's left himself with a really tough spare of the 3, 6, 9, 10. But watch this doll. This is how you create power. Look at the cup wrist at the top, and then he just uncups it onto the lane. He does a great job of stabilizing his spine going to the foul line, Rob. He said it was like a piece of charcoal. See how sandblasted that thing was? It looked like it had snow tires on it. Nice. Maybe put some chains on it. It is snowing outside here in Detroit. Costly open frame, 3, 6, 9, 10. Trying to get that back pin, that's the tough one. Probably the hardest non-split conversion out here on tour. Well, that one found the pocket and had the right delivery man to send that final message. And a super break there with something rolling over and taking the four pin out, watch this. It's going to be the three pin that comes over and takes the four out. Machuga's second strike. Oh man, is he dancing with that gutter? And you know, you can see this at release where his fingers are directly behind the bowling ball. Watch this, how his hand stays right up the back, just a slight rotation there. That ball's on the one and a half board, but because of that roll, he gets it to read that part of the lane, which quite honestly, I didn't think you could, you could do from out there and get the ball back and hook it into the pocket. Mike Pachuga, he may have found something. Yes, he has back-to-back -back jacks for the former All-American at the University of Nebraska. Love that angle with the ball coming right in your grill. Takes a lot of nerves, a lot of skill, and some maple moxie to be playing the one-two board on television. So Rash, his effort now in the fifth. He has gone strike, spare, open frame nine, strike. Messenger, not strong enough. We've seen a lot of those rolling, lazy messengers the last couple weeks, I feel like. Walter Ray Williams Jr. had a few last week, a little bit stronger than that. Well, last week, Walter Ray had one late that barely got the 10 out before the machine hit the pin. And then he got a fast one. And that was really the undoing of Bill O'Neill, those two great breaks. But, you know, any pro will tell you that you got to have good breaks to win out here. Unfortunately, Sean Rash was not able to capitalize on the trip for the frame before this. So now he's looking to start stringing some strikes down by 15, sixth frame. And there's your strike, probably the cleanest strike he's had yet. In this opening match of our bonus bowling stepladder final, the conclusion of Rash Machuga when we return to Taylor, Michigan. 
The Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour on ESPN is brought to you by Lumber Liquidators. Hardwood flooring for less. By GEICO. 15 minutes could save 15% on your car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. By Motel 6, the official lodging partner of the PBA. And by Denny's, where America's favorite breakfast is now available to go. Real breakfast 24-7. Ninth consecutive season the PBA has been at Taylor Lanes. Well, we're just about halfway through our opening match between Sean Rash and Mike Machuga. A match that originally was not scheduled, but a scoring malfunction in the position round made this necessary. Here are the two competitors on what exactly transpired. Being that it is a pinfall tournament, uh, the reason for my appeal was because Sean Rash did bull on the correct lane, not only on the right pair, but on the correct lane, his score should have counted originally. That is why I appealed. Uh, Kirk felt that it was a match play uh, game and that that match should be bowled against the proper opponent. It's good and it's bad. You know, it'll be something that'll be talked about, I'm sure, all year long. I'm sure people hate me for it, for bowling a good game. Um, I'm sure people hate the PBA for it. But, you know, I. You know, a lot of the players gave me some remorse last night saying, look, Sean, you just bowled what you were supposed to bowl. And on the pair, you're supposed to bowl and who you're supposed to bowl after it happened. And that definitely made me feel a little bit better after, you know, about an hour of thinking about it. And I think they did the best they could with the situation. The original ruling, I do not agree with. But I think that they did the best they could with the situation. And, I, and I'm very grateful that they, they gave, still give me a chance to win the trophy. And, folks, what happened was Sean Rash actually bowled against the wrong opponent in match play the last game. But not Rash's fault. Not Rash's fault, no. And I think hate's a pretty strong word to be using. But Sean didn't bowl against the right opponent. Mike Machuga's score did count. Sean got to bowl another game, now knowing what score he needed to leapfrog Mike Machuga into the show. Look at that hanger. Wow! So what ends up happening is, Sean Rash needs to shoot 256 or better to go around Mike Machuga. And so what does he do? He shoots 257. Well, now Mike Machuga is knocked out of the show. The decision's made. Hey, listen, to make all things fair, what if both of you make the telecast? We'll add a match. And both players agree to it. And I think it was the right decision. An equitable decision for all parties and ESPN not to pat our company on the back that did the proper thing and saying, you know what, let, we understand you're going to go over your normal hour and a half time frame. That is fine. Let's make sure that this is solved the way it needs to be properly done. So here we are after six. We begin the seventh. Machuga up 24. Rash has yet to string together a pair of strikes. Pretty good one right there. Machuga starting to find his line. Rob, I went over and I watched the players practice over on the practice pairs, and I saw Mike Machuga playing out over there, and I asked the guys, I said, are you, are you supposed to be playing out there? And, and they all agreed unanimously, no. What Mike Machuga is doing right now is, I, I think, is, uh, is a big shock to not only the, the players that are here today, but the players that may be watching. You're not supposed to play that part of the lane. But he's doing it. He is and doing succeeding. it. Uh, you see the look on Rash's face. I'm going to take it. But he's going to the left of the head pin and getting himself a Brooklyn strike. Yeah, and this match right now for Sean Rash has been nothing but good breaks. He goes Brooklyn here to catch his first double of the match and climb to within 14 pins of Mike Machuga. But you can see Sean's ball reaction. If he doesn't get the ball far enough to the right, there's not enough buildup in the middle part of the lane to hold the ball online. Rash's fourth strike in the first seven frames, and as you mentioned, Randy, his first pair of strikes. Looking for three in a row here. And this is what happens when you're, you're kind of bowling in a phone booth. Sean Rash went Brooklyn. He knows he's got to give the ball a little bit more room to the right, but he also knows that if he gets it going too far to the right, that's what happens. Destroys that spare. 
We're going to need four new ones on the left lane. Machuga up 18 in the eighth. Machuga telling us yesterday, Randy, he's a big advocate of the gravity swing. Tell us more about that. You want me to explain gravity yeah, swing I'm, to I'm, you? Yeah, I understand gravity. Right here, Mike Machuga looking to capitalize on Sean Rash not throwing a three bagger, it leaves a 2A10 at the worst possible moment. But the gravity swing is where you push the ball away and then you let gravity control the arm swing. The weight of the ball and gravity, and basically what it does is it makes your swing about as free as you can possibly get it. So there's no tension, it's just a free, repeatable swing. If you think about mus a, a swing that's muscled and, and, and you know, you're arming it and jer jerking on it and grabbing it, that's not going to be near as consistent as something that's free falling and gravity is constantly making that ball and that swing go in the same spot every time. Norm Duke's a big advocate. Obviously, Mike Machuga, out of the same school, he's a big advocate. We begin the foundation frame. Machuga off his first open frame. High and heavy on that one. And right now for Mike Machuga, he should be thinking about filling frames with marks because the look that Sean Rash has on the lanes doesn't look very good. And I think that Mike's mindset should be, hey, if I mark here in the ninth and 10th frame, I'm gonna be in the high 190s. That may be enough to beat Sean Rash who doesn't look like he's able to double. Well, that spare pickup was borderline mandatory for Machuga. So Machuga can now max out at 207. Rash can top him at 211. And here's Rash getting set in the ninth. Last season, four top 10 finishes and one victory for Rash. That one victory, a major, coming at the USBC Masters. This season, he is fifth on the PBA points leader list and sixth on the money list. So off to a, a fairly hot start for the young man from Wichita. And that right there is kind of my point. You know, a little bit further right of that and it runs the risk of going wide. A little bit left of that, it's through the nose of Brooklyn. So, Sean Rash, in all likelihood will convert the four pin here. And he will need three in the 10th to shoot 2-0-0. And there's another block. Wow, one. So, first one's $100, <laughs> is it? That'll be a shot clock violation. It's not a foul because he didn't let go of the bowling ball. Mm. Can you oh. say traction? Safe. $100 for the first shot clock violation. $500 after that. And again, Rash had huge problems to open up the season in the first televised match of our season with that type of issue. And is part of that the fact that he just throws it so darn hard? Well, he had some spare issues this week. He missed a lot of single pin spares. And I think that's why he, he balked on that particular shot there. And then as you can see, raising the arms after he made the four pin, which quite honestly is a routine spare that these guys can make with their eyes closed. So he had some spare ball issues, had some spare single, single pin spare issues. Situation is simple. Sean Rash can strike out to shoot 200 on the nose. Mike Machuca can go strike spare to shoot 197. There's your strike for Rash. Timely. He'll need this one to force Mike Machuga to throw a double. And Sean gives the lanes a rash. Did you see that sign? They call him diaper, as in diaper rash. How you want? There's got to be a cream or an ointment for that. I know there is, because I have several tubes of it at my house. That's right, you do have little ones. Yes. Big shot coming up for Sean Rash. This one here will force Mike Machuga to double. If Sean can get at least eight on his fill shot. It's 
some good quick math, my friend. I'm impressed. Now all Mike Machuga needs is a mark and good count. You can see why the chameleon pattern is living up to its name. Low scores to start. We'll see how the lanes change as the day goes on. We're going to talk more about this chameleon oil pattern as our broadcast continues. So Rash is in the books. At 190. So now what does Mike Machuga do? Does he take a spare ball and throw it straight down the middle to try to leave himself a single pin spare? He's playing right on the edge of the right gutter. The slightest mistake to, to the right, Mike Machuga will get zero. If he misses too far left, he could go through the nose and run the risk of a big split. Perfect. Or you can just pure it like that. Mm -hmm. And Machuga moves on. We talked about all the televised success for Sean Rash. This season, he's now 0 for 2 on the 2. Perfect arm swing, great hand. That ball behaves perfectly. Mike Machuga gets the strike he's looking for. And Mike does what any professional bowler does on television who's thinking the right thoughts. He says, you know what, I only shot 197 playing out. Let me grab another ball and look for another part of the lane. I got a ball. Where are they at? So the three seed, Brian Kretzer now waiting in the wings. And Machuga is going to go into his bag and take out another ball. And let's, let's do some more. Uh, Research and development, some more trial and error here. A little more R&D, the spare means nothing, so he's gonna get another ball out, something that's a little bit more aggressive, and he's gonna look for another line. Or the outside line with a different ball. Yeah, don't read into it's that okay. miss all of right. the 10 pin. He wasn't aiming for it at all. He was looking for a line for his next match versus the three seed, Brian Kretzer. So Machuga's appeal earlier this week pays right, huge on. dividends for him. He would have been out of this tournament. Now he moves on to take on Brian Kretzer. Match number two with a return and a profile of the great Del Ballard Jr. Glad you're back with us as ESPN continues our coverage of the Chameleon Championship. And we continue, Randy, our top 50 countdown of the all-time greatest bowlers in PBA history. We begin at number 32 this week. The late great Jim Godman won 11 times and three majors in his career. Rookie of the Year in 1965 and won the Tournament of Champions in 1969 and 73. Wayne Zahn won 13 career titles, was a PBA charter member, and also named PBA Player of the Year in 1966. At number 30, TJ, Tommy Jones, 12 titles, including two majors, a former Rookie of the Year, and one of just three players to win both Player and Rookie of the Year honors. Del Ballard Jr. won all 13 of his titles in a seven-year span from 87 to 93. We'll have more on Dell in just a moment. At number 28, Harry, that Tiger Smith, won the 1960 BPAA All-Stars for his first career, title and his first major title inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame in 1975. After winning his first title in 1966, Jim Stefanich broke out with nine titles over the next two seasons. It was the 1968 PBA Player of the Year, but we focus back on Dell Ballard Jr., number 29. His first career victory came in the 1987 U.S. Open, which made him the first bowler to win a six-figure first place prize. Bo Burton with more on Dell Ballard Jr. The number 29 spot in our countdown belongs to Dell Ballard Jr. The Texan was dominant in a seven-year span from 1987 to 1993 when he won all 13 of his career titles. Including those 13 wins were a pair of U.S. Opens, a Masters Championship, and a Tournament of Champions victory. His 1987 U.S. Open title worth $100,000, made him the first player in PBA history to collect a six-figure first-place check. And there's a live look at Dell on his left. 
lovely wife, Carolyn Dorn Ballard, who took part in the PBA Women's Series here in Taylor, and on her lap, daughter Alicia. And just a reminder that we will reveal the number one player in the PBA's 50 Greatest Countdown during the live telecast of the H&R Block Tournament of Champions on January 25th. That one from Red Rock Lanes in Las Vegas, where Norm Duke will also be looking for an unprecedented fourth consecutive major victory in that event as we take an updated look at today's bracket. Machuga wins it 196-190 over Sean Rash, so he now takes on Brian Kretzer. Strikes, and I believe that was the ball that he threw to test at the end of his first match. Very observant. Very observant, my friend Rob. You are correct, sir. Do not mock me. Here's Brian Kretzer. He actually beat Machuga twice this week in qualifying. So we start with a pair of strikes. And that deep inside line for Brian Kretzer is home sweet home. Loves playing the inside line. He's got a really soft hand at the bottom of the swing, and he can rotate the ball about as much as anybody out here when he feels the need. He's been working very hard on changing up some things, becoming a little bit more versatile, staying close in the early games, and then going to his A game as the lanes start to transition. Is that 10 going to go down? Yeah. Uh, Kretzer told us yesterday that the added match really works in his favor. More oil goes down the lane and left better for him. He's excited that there is a match before him today. Get a little bit of carry down. The lane settled down a bit. And the guys, uh, through practice in one game, there's some traffic in front of him. Strike spare for Kretzer. One of two bowlers on today's men's telecast. And they're seeking their first Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour title. The other being the number one seed, Bill O'Neill, who is making back-to-back -back televised appearances. This is Mike Machuga, his 11th career televised finals appearance. Again, just one win. It came in 05 on this oil pattern. New ball working just fine. Two strikes to start off. And what that bowling ball does for Mike Machuga, because it's stronger, is he doesn't have to apply as much pressure or as much hit at the bottom of the swing, allowing him to keep it more online. But the thing that Mike Machuga really worked on this week was keeping his hand and his elbow to the inside part of the ball. And I say it on a weekly basis. Pros work the inside part of the ball. Amateurs work the outside part. Rut row, Raggy. Mike Machuga's found a home on the outside part of the lane. So Machuga knocks down a turkey to start off match number two. And setting the tone early. And Kretzer has to realize that. And not that he has to make any significant changes right now, but he knows he's going to need to put up some points. Strike, spare, strike. And what's really crazy about this chameleon pattern, and this is the last time that you'll see this pattern exclusively this season, is how deep Brian Kretzer already is. We had some practice. We've had one match bowled on this TV pair. And Brian Kretzer is already in between the fifth and sixth there on the left side of the lane. And that shot there, Rob, is the other thing that Brian Kretzer has been working on is a little bit of loft, getting a little bit more loft into his game. And what that does is it just delays hook. After the flat 10 on the left lane, he said, you know what, I got to get this ball to finish a little bit stronger into the pocket. Let me give it a little, let me get a little air under this shot. Machuga, four top eight finishes last season. This will be his best result of this campaign. What a ball change, huh? So Machuga opens up with four strikes in a row. 
Again, oh, that's fundamentally very sound. I think he's got right. one of the best physical games out here. And when he's healthy, he throws a lot of shots that look like this. in a row for Machuga. Did you miss your other opportunity in the four frame? Because I didn't hear it. I'm sorry, what happened? Well, he got four in a row. You got a four bagger. I didn't. I'm not contractually obligated to say ham bone every time somebody pulls four in a row. I'm sorry. I, I, if you did, I, I missed it parts. You did not miss it. Okay. Me. All right. Now, Kretzer has an opportunity now for a hand bone, my friend, and should he, I'll be more than happy to bark it out for our fans. We've got some good hand bone signs out here today. A couple of hand bone haters as well. We've got a really good match shaping up here. Yeah. Brian Kretzer can find a strike here on the left lane. And we're blowing the scores out already from match number one where Machuga beat Rash 196 to 190. These guys are heavy into the 200s right now, at this pace at least. I can't show right from my office. God. Well, and this is the same risk that Sean Rash faced playing that deep inside line. Did you see Brian? Just a little hop there. I don't know if that affected that shot a whole lot, but he just gets it a little bit wide of target down the lane and he runs into a little bit of oil that makes the ball go light. Two four Five. ten, yeah! How about that? That's some buckeye ball there! Enjoy it. Kretzer, a devout Ohio State fan, was in enemy territory this week. We will tell you about his Buckeye Wolverine confrontation when we return. Twenty-fourth season overall that Taylor Lanes has hosted a PBA tour stop and will be back in Taylor next weekend for the ultimate scoring championship. Maybe no better time for a 300 televised game than next Sunday. And then in two weeks, we are north of Chicago in Vernon Hills for the Carmen Salvino Scorpion Championship. Take a look now at the Denny's Player of the Year points list. And on top, Norm Duke, followed by Walter A. Williams Jr. Tied for third is Bill O'Neill, who is our number one seed today in the Chameleon Championship. Wes Malott is standing by. He'll have the next match, and he's at number eight. This has been a high-scoring affair. Machuga, five frames, five strikes, looking to open up a six-pack. Oh, yeah! Boy, he's taking a page right out of Norm Duke and Walter A. Williams' book of how to play the lanes where you're not supposed to. He's found a home in the outside part of the lane, really soft with his hand, and just letting that bowling ball do all the work. What will disrupt that home? Nothing, because there's nobody else that's going to play out there. I don't see anybody else playing out there. I don't know if they can, if Wes Millot or Bill O'Neill can get their hands soft enough to get that straight. He's got the touchdown, looking for the extra point here. Seven in a row. Mm -mm. To go a bit right the good news is no 4 9 split. Minimal damage. Wonderful start for Machuga. Just a pinch high, gets a good luck tap there on the four pin, only leaving the nine, and yes, you're right, a great start. Takes care of his first fair opportunity here in match number two. Again, Machuga took care of Sean Rash, 196-190 in our opening match. He is easily gonna eclipse that 196. Brian Kretzer. Has gone strike, spare, then three consecutive strikes, and another spare. Here he is in the seventh, as you 
See the scroll of our, of our other finishers this week. Oh, Whoa. One five seven eight. Had to be more pins up there. That was a shoe issue. Brian Kretzer had to get break in a new pair of shoes at the start of the season, and although he's been bowling very, very well this season, occasionally there's some issues with his slide sole and that slide foot. Completely different pair of shoes. The reason being is that the shoes that he was wearing that company is no longer product registered with the Lumber Liquidator P Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour. So Brian was forced to go to another manufacturer that is allowed to compete or to be shown out here. And it's taken him a little bit of time to break it in and, and it's you know what he was wearing before and what he's wearing now is is like night and day. Just takes him a little bit of time to get used to the new pair of shoes. Is it pretty much just a slide issue? It, it, yeah, but it's not consistent. There's nothing wrong with the pair of shoes he's wearing now. They're just different. They feel different. They fit a little bit different. They're made differently. Machuga off his only spare here in the eighth. And gets right back on the strike train. Again, just beautiful form going to the foul line, and he's he's really taking his wrist out of this shot. Just see just a slight cup and real soft through it at the bottom of the swing. But the thing to look at is that perfect balance, eyes on target, and a perfect result. I whiffed it. That's a lot. And really the only errant shot of this game for Mike Machuga, he just gets a little quick with that shot. And but again, the, I think you, you know, the folks at home need to realize what a fine line it is, Rob, between missing it just a little bit or catching just a little bit too much of it at the point of release. And again, all of his spare opportunities this match have been single spin spares. He's taking care of both of them. So Kretzer steps up, and he's going to need to string some serious strikes together. And you knew Kretzer would be in the red. He's going to tell you, though, it's Scarlet. He's a diehard Ohio State fan. Came to our meeting yesterday wearing Archie Griffin's number 45 jersey and a Buckeye hat. Oh, boy. Well, you saw him brushing his shoe after his last shot, and what that's going to do is it's going to rough up that sole, and so here he sticks. I told you about Kretzer and all of his Ohio State love. He is done in this match, but he has been all week in Detroit, which is not far from Ann Arbor, which is the University of Michigan territory. Yeah, what happened with the... Uh... So he's, he's grocery shopping yesterday. Right. And he's wearing his Buckeye garb, and he's going down one of the lanes, you know. Getting some rice aroni or something, and somebody goes to him, awfully brave. There's a Michigan guy, and Kretcher just kept on walking, and then Kretcher's point is, hey, Michigan fan, you're awfully brave for barking at me. You're, you you got a losing season. You're having the worst season in Michigan football history. They lost at home yesterday to Northwestern, a game that Wes Malott was at, and Wes Malott is up next, and up next for Mike Machuga. Well, Brian Kretzer is having a very nice season. He's not going to win this match, but I don't think this is the last time you'll see Brian Kretzer on the telecast this season. Kretzer came in today eighth on the PBA points leader list, just behind Wes Malak, who is up next. So 137 career events without a title for Brian Kretzer. It'll now go to at least 138. And another ball change. Although I'm not so sure about that one because he was he was pulling a pretty big game with this bowling ball here. So I think there's a point where you know you start to fidget a bit too much and it's overkill. Overthinking, I, absolutely, overkill. absolutely. You know I think 247 if he strikes here is going to win just about every just about every match no matter who he bowls.
So Machuga, six pins better than Rash in match number one. 57 pins better than Kretzer in match number two. Wes Malott waiting in the wings. And here's a scary thought, folks. He doesn't even feel like he's bowling well yet this season. Liquidators PBA Tour on ESPN is brought to you by Bayer. The more you know, the more you trust Bayer. By Prescription Flomax. By CLR. CLR. All kinds of dirty, one kind of clean. And by the United States Bowling Congress. Ensuring the integrity and protecting the future of the sport of bowling. Bowl with us. Detroit, home of the big three automobile companies, GM, Ford, Chrysler. Wes Malott, the big two seed here to take on number five seed Mike Machuga as you take an updated look at the bracket for the Chameleon Championship. We are in Taylor, Michigan, named after Zachary Taylor, the 12th president of the United States of America. Did you just make that up? I did not. That is a fact. I have another great fact about Detroit for you a little bit later. I know you're excited. There's Malat, and here's Machuga. Starts the way he began match number two with a strike. And don't think that your tournament leader, Bill O'Neill, and Wes Malat haven't been watching what's going on. They came over and threw practice balls, and I guarantee you they tried to find something to the out part of the, or the outside part of the lane. So let's see where Wes Malott tries to attack the chameleon pattern. How about out? You like that strategy? I mean, it worked right there. If you look at where the other two players that played way in shot, it, I mean, 188 by Brian Kretzer, 190 by Sean Rash, two great inside players. Wes Malott. He's a great inside player as well, but he figures he's got a better shot at trying to get around the area where Mike Machuga is playing. Malott made six televised appearances last season for the second consecutive season, which matched his career high. He set in 06 07. This is his second of this season. And his second strike of this match. Ten top eight finishes last season, tied for most with Chris Barnes and Walter Ray Williams Jr. Call him the big nasty. I think it's one of the better nicknames. If you ask me, I like it. Oh. Oh, I guess okay. it's a good break. Machuga opened up match number two with six straight strikes. Will not duplicate that here in match number three. But again, I'm sorry, but again, it's a single spin spare that he has to deal with. Because he trips a two pin late. So, yeah, avoiding those splits and uh, single pin spares, that's that's the object if you don't hit the pocket. Right now, Mike Machiga, he's got a little competition early on. Wes Malott's decided to play a little bit closer to where Mike is, albeit he's left on the approach, circling a little bit more. Mike Machiga, I guarantee you, he's thinking about that in the back of his mind. And trip two. That one looked like he was going a little further right. That's kind of what we saw in match number one. Yeah, it wiggled a little bit down lane and didn't get up into the pocket. But again, a huge break there. And, you know, your opponents don't like that. When you start tripping two pins and going Brooklyn for strikes. We haven't seen too many bad breaks today at all either. Well, we've seen a few of these. Yeah. And Wes Malott just turned his back on this one as soon as he let it go. 
This ball looked like it was in the right, right zone. It just didn't have any hand in it, so it never responded down the lane. You see how you make, go about making the 1 2 4 10. And I believe the guys are 100% on the washout today. Mike Machuga made one in the first match, as well as Sean Rash. Everybody else has done it. Oh, go. did he play that well? He hear me gave the shout out. Everybody else has done it. So you, you saw Wes Malak go to the tape, and he goes to the tape a lot. He carries a pocket knife with him. He's constantly, constantly messing with that thumb hole, man. He's got to have it just right. So let's see how this shot is out of his hand. Well, I believe that's seven more than I, th than I think he thought he was going to get. <laughs> Now, it's one thing if you're going straight up the one-two board. It's another when you're throwing it in the, into that direction. And I thought for a minute that ball had a chance of going in. As you see, how do you make the 3-6-10? We saw in match number one where Machuga beat Rash 196-190. The, the chameleon oil pattern really kind of had both of them guessing, maybe about through the first 50% of this match. Match number two, it seemed like they both had it figured out, Kretzer and Machuga. And match three... Back to the. Oh no. Oof. Back to the board again as they're trying to really get a better grasp on this thing. An open frame there for him a lot in the fourth. We're going to remember that one. So Malat started strike, strike, then went spare, open frame. Machuga, strike, spare, strike. Here he is in the fourth. Well, as the lanes transition, the shots tend to change. This is just a little bit left to target with a little bit more hand than he wanted. The good news, he only leaves the 3-6. Oh, talked about the oil. Let's talk about it for the detail. Lumber liquidators know the wood. Well, it's 40 feet. The chameleon pattern resembles a retro approach to pattern design where the oil is applied in strips and require, requires bowlers to play in a specific zone on the lane. Most of the time, deep inside. We only had one 300 game this week, that by Dino Castillo. That oil, 40 feet long, as that graphic showed you, but applied in strips. Yeah, that's what I said. I wasn't listening. Kind of. Were you talking? I have a tendency to zone you out sometimes. You bore me. Man, what is going on here, Mike? Big challenge here for Machuga. Well. And, and now it almost looks like the zone that Mike Machuga's in, he needs to now downshell or go to a ball that's not as aggressive so that that ball will hold its line to the 1-3 pocket. <laughs> And a great opening for Wes Malott. After Malott gave Matruga an opening with the open frame. We like to call this a seesaw match, right? Oh. In is, the that, biz. is that another bowling term I need to learn and put down on my cheat sheet? Seesaw match. Actually, actually that's a universal phrase. I'm going to put that right, that right next to bucket, baby split, and clean game. You could use that in a multitude of sports. Oh, Wes. But we're going to use it for today. Gotcha. Malott in the fifth, up six. And the chess match continues. Spent some time with Wes Malad in Asia over the summer. Him and I went to Okinawa, Japan, Kadena Air Force Base, and put on a show for the men and women of our armed forces. And uh, he was just a, a great guy to to be around and we had some good times, some good laughs, played a little golf and did some bowling and some instructional clinics, had a great time. Milan, his fourth strike. 
And second in a row. And as we head to break, Malat takes a seat with some much needed momentum. Open with the pair, is closing with the pair as we go to break when we return the conclusion of Machuga Malat. And we welcome you back to ESPN's continuing live coverage of the Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour. This week we are in Taylor, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. Detroit founded in 1701 by the Frenchman Antoine de la Moffe Cadillac. How about that? Did you know that? Wow, Rob. That's I, good stuff. I know. You never cease to amaze me, my friend. I realize You that. are brilliant. Machuga in the sixth. Off an open frame. Strikes and new ball. And that's the ball change that I was referring to after his last shot went through the nose. He went to a less aggressive bowling ball and something that would hold its line. Now that ball early on wasn't strong enough. Now it looks like it's just right. Flow Max quickly update hey, on Machuga. You say a Thank less you. aggressive bowling ball. What, what does that mean about the dynamics of the ball? The cover stock isn't as aggressive, it isn't as porous, and the dynamics of the inside of the weight block um, isn't as strong or powerful. So there, therefore, it, it, it has a little bit greater resistance to rotation, and that'll help the ball stay straighter. Just three strikes through the opening six frames for Machuga. None of them have been strung together in the first, the third, and the sixth. There's his first back-to-back, -back Jack, in match number three. Well, a professional adjustment and then two very well-executed shots equals a double for Mike Machuga and puts him right back into this match. Malat working off a double of his own. Lead at sixth, six, as we begin the seventh for Malat. Get it! Ooh. Can't wait to see the replay on how uh, just how little that messenger missed that by. Messenger in front of the ten. Gotta hate this when this happens. It goes hunting. Right in front of the 10. Wes Malott was looking for that to carry to give him a three bagger. Malott picks up the single spare conversion, his second televised appearance of this season. It's been a strong start for the Big Nasty. Second show of the season early. Um, I'm with a new company, Rotogrip. And I'm in the process of learning new balls again, so it, it's it's all you know it's a learning experience every time I get out there, and uh, you know hopefully uh, you know everything stays good, and and uh, I continue with rotor grip. I learn these balls well, and and then the wins will start coming into falling into place. Just three career tour titles from a lot, one of them coming last year in Medford. Oh, hey. This fifth strike of this match. The winner to take on the number one seat, Bill O'Neill. Machuga, though, has found some recent momentum. Strikes in the sixth and the seventh, looking for three in a row here in the eighth. This to take the lead. The lead is his. Machuga, the five seed, looking for his third straight win to propel him to the championship. Well, it's a great ball change and obviously great execution. So it's it's one thing to just go ahead and change balls, but you have to do it with conviction so that you can execute the shots properly. Mike Machuga has done that in the sixth, seventh, and eighth frame. his only title on this very same chameleon pattern.
catch four bagger, and he loves the shot. Watch him walk it out immediately. Great ball change. Great ball change, indeed. If he doesn't say so himself. West Willock can strike out ninth and tenth to shoot 231. Mike Machuga can strike out in the tenth for 236. Back to back jacks for Big West. Now, how is that messenger in front of the 10 looking for West Malott? Looming rather significantly. A lot can happen. Looks like Mike Machuga is now dialed in, but there's nothing like putting a little pressure on your opponent. West Malott can do that with three strikes in the 10th frame. Three times in this match, Malat has strung together consecutive strikes, yet to get three in a row. Be right. You can make Ten such a good move and a great shot. Well, you, you just can't get throw back. it much better than this shot, and he just gets the massive ring and ten. Watch the six pin do a little do si do with the ten pin right there. And oh man, when you're working goodness. on a double trying to win a title, that's the last thing you want to have happen. <laughs> well, the strike here on the spill shot, Mike Machuga will just have to get good count with any kind of mark, and he will both. Bill O'Neill for the title. Chuga has in store for him. Well, he pulled a great game, just two shots. That uh, messenger, 10 pin in the seventh, bring him 10 in the tenth, otherwise he shuts out Mike Machuga. Right now, Mike Machuga, any kind of a mark, good count, he moves on. And Machuga looking for five Sorry, straight strikes here. Five it is. There's your best kind of mark. Michael Chica will bowl Bill O'Neill for the title. The only time we'll see Chameleon pattern exclusively, Mike Machuga has won his only title on this very oil pattern. There's Bill O'Neill, the native of Levittown, Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia, looking on and keeping an eye on will be his competitor in the title match. Between them, they've won just one tour title. And that one going to Mike Machuga. Happened in Council Bluffs, Iowa, at the 05 Greater Omaha Classic. And as you mentioned, on the chameleon oil pattern, which is what we are bowling today. And in that match, he defeated Bill O'Neill for the title, 256 to 245. This one ends up 221, 210. So Machuga's rolled a 196, a 245, and now a 221 to move on as the number five seed to take on Bill O'Neill in the championship. And we welcome you back to ESPN's continuing live coverage of the Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour. We are set for our men's title match. The Chameleon Championship up for grabs. Rob Stone, Randy Peterson, glad you're spending part of your Sunday with us. 
as we take a look at our Geico Championship Recap. Randall? Thanks, Rob. Match number one, Mike Machuga, Sean Rash. This was a war of attrition. Mike Machuga holding on late, getting the first strike in the tenth to win that match. Then in our second semi, or excuse me, our second stepladder finals, Machuga takes on Brian Kretzer. This time, Machuga throws six in a row, shoots 245 to end Brian Kretzer's day. And then the last match, the first shot in the tenth frame seals the deal. Mike Machuga defeating Wes Mallott, 221 to 210. Machuga, 19 strikes through the three matches. And again, Machuga, a five seed. Originally, they were only supposed to be four seeds on this televised broadcast. A scoring malfunction earlier in the week led the PBA officials to come to an executive decision to have both Sean Rash and Mike Machuga duel an opening match to see who would move on to take on the three seeds. Machuga originally was out and got himself back in. And with that strike, starts off this championship match the way he has started every single match today with a strike. Except for the first match. <laughs> I, was waiting, I was waiting for that one, Parts. Sounded too good to be good true. Good catch. Bill O'Neill, 27 years old, looking for his first tour title. O'Neill starts with the strike, and this is O'Neill on being the number one seed. I'll take my chances in one game. Uh, I'd rather have ball one game than, than try to win three. Uh, you can give me the number one seed every week, I'll take it. Master of the obvious with the sound bite there. Yeah, but think of all the TV time he's missing out on, not qualifying fifth or fourth and going up the ladder like Mike Machuga. I guess. <laughs> the airtime, brother. It's all about, I know. You're it's all about, about face time. I know you're all about that game. So both O'Neill and Machuga start with strikes. Here's O'Neill in the second. For having not bowled these lanes all day outside of a few practice shots, boy, O'Neill looks like he's got them figured out early. Yeah, Bill O'Neill dominated this event. He was number one after the first round of qualifying. He stayed there after the second round and then just continued on in the two rounds of match play. Back-to-back -back jacks for Machuga, the five seed. O'Neill, the PBA points leader, is fourth on the money list. And here's our title match showdown, O'Neill and Machuga. And again, remember that the only title for Mike Machuga came on this very same Chameleon oil pattern against Bill O'Neill. There's a thing in literary terms called irony. I've heard of that yeah. word. I've heard of that word before. I'm not sure what it means, but. Boy, it looked like at release that Mike Machuga got around that one just a little bit more than he wanted to. And watch this ball break loose. And you see the back end reaction there. That generally tells you that the hand kind of got around it a little bit more. He's telling it to woe. Pays the ultimate price. Big four in the third. Also known as the big ears. Two ears fall. Big ears. That's what I have on my cheat sheet. Yeah. Oh, I threw that one good. You haven't heard that term? Is it another term I've made up? I wouldn't put it past myself. O'Neill, 222.9 average this season, fourth best in the PBA. He's the 10. This young man voted the 0506 Rookie of the Year after leading all rookies in points, earnings, and match play appearances. And what a beautiful shot this is. He's been working very hard on his game, got his swing nice and straight, trying to get a little bit softer and becoming more versatile, not just a guy that plows on it at the bottom of the swing. O'Neill, a 
four-time All-American at Saginaw Good Valley putting. State University in University Center, Michigan, which is about 90 miles north of Detroit. A couple of his old college buddies made the trek down here. Again, this is the second straight televised appearance for O'Neill. Last week finished second in the Lake County Indiana Golden Anniversary Classic to Walter Ray Williams Jr. Took a lot. It took a lot. Yes. All right. Who hit that pin and with what? Might have been one of his fraternity brothers. Three strikes through four frames for O'Neill with an early big lead. Eight pin got it. Okay. Whoever. Finals when we return. Welcome back to Taylor Lanes in Taylor, Michigan, and the conclusion of the men's final, the Chameleon Championship. I want to remind you, tomorrow night, duel between two young guns. Brady Quinn looks to lead the Browns back into contention, while Trent Edwards is out to rally the Buffalo Bills back to their winning ways. Monday Night Football here on ESPN at 8.30 Eastern. Who do you like? I don't like Trent Edwards lately because he's single-handedly mauling my fantasy team. Hits okay. tail on waivers. How about that? How, who do I like? I like the Bills. There you have it. Machuga in the fourth, off an open frame eight. Wide lookout. That's not your best. And back to back shots of the big four split. Wow. Now the 1 2 8 10 washout. What's next? 7 10? That's if you can get it back to the pocket. Yeah. I think it just to me it looks like Mike is starting now to get too aggressive. It's a title match. Everything that he's worked for up until this point is coming to a head. And it looks like he's getting overly aggressive. Back to back over frames. It is really hard to win a title with back to back opens. And if you're Bill O'Neill trying to win your first career title, it's really hard to be sitting still over there when your opponent goes back-to-back -back opens. And sitting on the bench, you now have a 28-pin lead working on a strike. Bill has to keep his emotions in check. That's the move. Now he's dealing with double wood. We're, I mean, we're breaking out all the terms here with what Machuga's leaving. Remember, this is a lane he just big Ford on, and so he makes a little bit of an adjustment, and the ball never turns over. And so, I, go ahead, Rob. Uh, at least he puts the around. open frame run to an end with that spare pickup. Yeah, I mean, it almost looks like he needs to kind of do what Bill O'Neill and what Wes Malott did in the last match, and that's just to move in a little bit from where he's at now and get his hand into it a little bit more and kind of circle it a bit. Is it too late? Well, I'll let you know after the next two shots that O'Neill throws. Oh, and that shot never got far enough right, so it hit the hook spot that uh, Brian Kretzer and Sean Rass were using earlier in the day. And you see, this is this needs to get another three, three, three boards right of that to be able to have a chance to get to the pocket. Now, he leaves at 310. Looking to get the ball in between the three and the ten pin. Trying to take care of the baby split here. Buddy, you are breaking out all of the bowling verbiage today. Yeah. That was the baby split. You, know, you were talking about Machuga maybe being a little like that. ramped up, a little too like energetic oh, there. He's and, and getting a little geeked up, man. You uh, got to just, you know, chill out. And that was something that was a concern of O'Neill coming into this game when he bowled Walter A. Williams Jr. last week in, in Hammond. You know, he said, I was amped up. I, I, I could see it by the lack of carry. I was too fired up. This time, I hope to be a little bit calmer. Got a shot. His fourth strike of this title match. Rob, there's nothing like experience. And Bill O'Neill coming off of his show last week brings that experience into today. All he was hoping for coming in was 
to find a decent ball reaction and to make good shots. And the more he's in this situation, the more he'll be able to handle the nerves. Chuga rallies with a strike right here. And this the first of two title matches you'll see on today's live broadcast. Following this one, the PBA Women's Series takes to the lanes. Michelle Feldman taking on Jody Wessner. Mike Machuga looking to cut into Bill O'Neill's lead. The strike here, he can reduce that to 18. Rob, I think it's a must-strike situation. Must-strike he does. His fourth strike of this match and second time he's strung two together. It's all about fine-tuning and Mike Machuga there appeared to move further right, bring his speed up, back the hand out, and just rifle one to the one-three pocket. Very long. Nasty seven-day stretch of bowling for O'Neill. Again, last Sunday he was in Hammond, Indiana. Lost in the final. Gets a break there, dropping the seven, leaving just the ten. And then he got in the car for the four-hour drive from Hammond here to Detroit with Michael Fagan. And Michael Fagan was nice enough to drive a majority of that one rather than sleep in the passenger seat. But O'Neill got here. Monday bowled 14 games, Tuesday 18 games, took Wednesday completely off, another 14 games Thursday, 18 more on Friday, took yesterday off, and here he is in the final. Oh, baby. Nice. Oh, hey, welcome there. to the tour and bowling well. I mean, that's what we do, you know? You, you get on a roll and you don't, want, you don't want it to ever end. You bowl a lot of games, you make TV, you go to the next week and you hope to continue to ride that wave. And that last shot, Bill O'Neill dodged a huge bullet, not leaving the 7-10 split and maintaining an 18-pin lead. Both are finalists with four strikes through seven frames. We begin the eighth with O'Neill, the number one seed. Oh. Did not like it, hands on head. Just what we talked about, just what you had mentioned. Overly aggressive, too amped up, and throws it right through the break point. Now that ball, a little bit softer, a little bit softer speed. That has a chance to turn the corner, but not thrown that hard. And he left it open. Do you feel that? Uh, Do you feel that, Rob? Yeah, I felt that momentum change. There we, we go. We've got a we've got a sprint to the finish here as Machuga can take the lead here. It would be his first lead in this title match. Just a catch. Oh, Michael. Well, some days you're the dog and some days you're the hydrant. And right there, Mike Machuga gets the good break of not leaving the 2A10, only leaving the 2 pin, keeping himself well into this match. An open frame there would have been devastating. So Machuga picks up the spare in the eighth. And we begin the foundation frame with Machuga. Five pins separating these two. O'Neill trying to visualize his first career tour title. Machuga eyeballing his second. Gets them all. So is he the dog right now? I, I would say yes. And the head 
drops, and now it's O'Neill's turn. That's a great shot coming off of that open frame for Bill O'Neill. And his fate is in his hands. He can strike out and lock this matchup. Wonderful response from O'Neill. He has gone 64 career events without a title, eighth most of current exempt players. Twice he's been a runner up through his career, once already this season, and that was last week. Bill O'Neill, nicknamed the Real Deal, needs two strikes and six pins to get his first tour title. And we get closer. Had a feeling all season long that this was kind of coming for Bill O'Neill. This is, this is breakout season type bowling right now from him. And this next shot can be a defining moment in a professional's career. Left an opening for Mike Machuga. What a title match. 204 is the best that Bill O'Neill can shoot. Machuga can get a 210. It's going to be sit and wait time for Bill O'Neill. 204 for Bill O'Neill. Two strikes and five pins. Rack, please and Mike Machuga will win for the second time. And was, wasn't it you that we'll mentioned something about by. irony? His second, if he were to do that, his second title would come against the same guy? On the same oil pattern. On the same oil pattern. And you and I are like so in sync right now, buddy. Peanut butter and jelly, baby. Chocolate and milk. Again, two strikes, Shot, it's just a game. and then five, and the title is Machugas. Yeah, I, I, I had bad vibes about that one. He didn't look comfortable from the start of that, so now he's doing the smart thing. Regroup. Absolutely. Go back to the routine. Take your time. Machuga beat Rash in match one, 196-190. Took care of Kretzer in match two, 245-188, and then dispatched Wes Malott, 221-210 to get here to the title match versus Bill O'Neill. Two strikes and five for that title. O'Neill is done at 204. And there's strike one. Randy, your hands are perspiring. You're sweating. They are. You're not even rolling, son. They are, and you don't need big scores to have great title matches. This is a great title match. It's gonna come down to this shot. This reminds me of old school, back in the 80s, championship matches where it took like 210 to 208 to win the title. This is good stuff. A lot of strategy out there, guys making minor adjustments, but it just basically boils down to who wants it more and who's going to make the better shots. Must strike here or it's O'Neill's title. Strikes! Needs just five pins for title number two. That's what you came here for. And the potential for the second ever Machuga flop. Still needs five, though. Strategy, what are you doing no, right no here, flop. Randy? You take the spare ball? Here. Spare ball or strike ball and throw it right down the middle. I'm going to hit the one closest to you. There she is, title two for Machuga. And again, for the second straight week, Bill O'Neill is the bridesmaid.
his father Richard in attendance, as are some of his other relatives. You're not the only one who wants to see the Machuga flop. And remember, this is a guy who at one point earlier this week was technically out of this televised show. An adjustment made by the PBA allowed him to roll, allowed an extra competitor to play and compete here in the Chameleon Championship. And your five seed, Mike Machuga, moves on and wins it all from that five seed slot, defeating Bill O'Neill. 209 to 204. We'll hear from the winner when we return, plus the women's final. The Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour on ESPN is brought to you by Etonic, the official footwear of the PBA. By Denny's, where America's favorite breakfast is now available to go. Real breakfast 24-7. By GEICO. 15 minutes could save 15% on your car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. And by Lumber Liquidators. Hardwood flooring for less. I'd like to thank Ted Dobbins, the proprietor here at Taylor Lanes. Wonderful, wonderful Great hospitality man. this week. Daughter Erin, who's the general manager here. And one championship in the books, another on the way. Up now, the PBA Women's Series Chameleon Championship. This is the second of seven PBA Women's Series events this season. And it'll be a showdown between Michelle Feldman and Jody Wessner. Feldman, the one seed, and we want to remind you that Mike Machuga is in the booth with us. We'll hear from him just momentarily, just minutes after his second career title win. But this is Jody Wessner from Toledo, Ohio. She leaves herself a sleeper to start off with. Now, this, this, Jody is a, is a girl after many a man's heart. Her hobbies include poker and golf. Her favorite food is Mexican. She listens to Motley Crue. She's a big fan of the Ohio State Buckeyes, and her favorite movie is Caddyshack. Somebody put a ring on that woman's finger. Stat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Actually, she does have a ring on that finger. She is engaged. Her boyfriend, Aaron Hawkins, in attendance. <laughs> hey, we love that. Hey. And we are joined in the booth by Mike Machuga, who came all the way from the five slot to win his second career title. We take a live look at Michelle Feldman and we'll let her throw her first down the lane and then hit you up, Mike. You had to work for that one. I mean, not, not only just as the five seed, but we saw multiple ball changes by you. How did the lanes and your mentality progress throughout this whole tournament today? Well, I tell you what, it, it really just seemed like a lot of good guessing. They are real tough out there today. You know, we played the inside part of the lane the majority of the week, if not all of it. And uh, today, that just uh, it seemed really tough in there. And I just did the best I could to, to manage what was going on around that first arrow. You know, a little right, a little left, a little straighter, a little more hook, and a little softer, a little more speed. And uh, it just kind of felt like I was trying to hit the one closest to me most of the time. Mike, what went through your mind when Bill O'Neill gave you the opening knowing that you needed two strikes in the tenth to win. Well, you know, all I could remember was three years ago when, when he struck in the ninth. I, I just said, you know, geez, this is, this is the way it happened. It, you know, three weeks ago this week was, was the exact opposite situation. I had a chance to strike out in the ninth, tenth, and eleventh to shut him out. And uh, I really, I couldn't believe it until after he shut the tube. And I said, wow, this, you know, this is really happening. He really just gave me a chance. I feel like I deserved it, but, you know, with what, what comes to you. Feldman misses the 10 pins on open frame there in the second. You're, you're talking about the 05 Greater Omaha Classic in which you beat Bill O'Neill for your first tour title on this chameleon oil pattern. And Was it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we have some knowledge. This is what all the papers are here for to make us sound more intelligent than we really are in normal life. Here's Jody Wessner in the second. <laughs> 
bright light does have uh, a little wiggle spot on it. So what's the what's the secret? What's the key? What's the trick that you have to pull off on the right lane to get the ball to the one three? You know, I was really just making sure that uh, I just caught a little bit of it. Uh, I was only playing the board different with my feet, but I, I really just wanted to make sure that I caught just a little bit more of it on that lane just to make sure it caught uh, a little more than the left lane. We're going to flash back to that win at the Greater Omaha Classic in Council Bluffs, Iowa. That was 2005. You beat Bill O'Neill, and there is the Machuga flop, and there Ouch. are some disappointed fans Ouch. here that we did not get a, a second, a repeat yeah, of but the you Machuga got, flop. You got two girls out there bowling in those lanes right now that are very happy that I didn't do it. Hey, there's exactly. there's lanes on the outside. We, we'll, we'll light them up for you. They don't have oil on them. <laughs> He's having some problems finding the pocket here. What does Jody need to do, Mike? I really think that if she can get her feet and her target about four or five boards to the right, there is some pretty good friction out there from what I had built that uh, she can create a little margin for error out there. Michelle's not able to do that. She likes to play the middle part of the lane. I think Jody needs to scoot a little right, try to find some friction. Her first televised finals appearance this season rolled a high of 267 this week, did Jody? And in July of this year, she actually beat Jason Couch in Cincinnati. I know you were highlighting and putting stars next to that tidbit, Randy. What are you talking about? <laughs> she actually, she had a great match against Couch. She beat him 279 to 257 in Cincinnati at Cherry Grove Lions, where Brian Himmler, PBA champion, owns the pro shop. She bowled great. She said Jason was very gracious in, the, in defeat, so. I don't know what your agenda is, mister. I have no agenda. Michelle Feldman, that is the first strike of this match, and Michelle is dealing with some thumb issues right now. Mike, talk about just how sensitive the release zone is. You know, if you catch it a little too much, if you, if you don't catch quite enough of it, and how that translate in, translates into ball motion down the lane. You know, this pattern isn't the longest of patterns that we bowl on. It's a, it's a little bit shorter, and especially in the TV set, these lanes have been cleaned, have been walked on, there's debris all over them, so they need to be cleaned again. So they've been extra cleaned over the last couple of days, and that accentuates the shortness of the pattern. So anything that has a little bit of grab or a little extra hit is going to end up right in the middle of the hit pin. The oil just 40 feet long. Wessner still trying to find her first strike and leaves double wood. That's the third time she's done that in her opening four frames. Well, if you keep leaving that, what's the adjustment you need to make? Right, right, right. So you're telling me right? I would say move right. Okay. What do you think, Randy? I think I'd move right. You know, if you talk as loud as you did when I was bowling, you might be able to get her to move right. He was loud, wasn't Ouch. he? Well, you know what? And this is the second time she's going to make that skirt. But you know what, Mike? It's hard when you've got a headset on. You've got Morgan Daly, my producer, yelling in one ear and Rob Stone yelling in the other. I can't even hear myself think, buddy. I love you, buddy. I'm just busting on you. You know that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be ripping on each other on the golf course yeah. here soon. Well, and, and apparently my yelling... Uh, according to you, really hurt your chances of winning today. So you better think of a new one, mister. Yes, sir. <laughs> she looks a little better. She that one well. Yeah. Nice and there strike. we go, her first strike of this title match in the PBA Women's Series. And Mike, you're right. You know, she's going to keep inching right and inching right. And um, I think she's going to find a home where you had played the lanes all day today. And, you know, we had talked about this oil pattern not being able to play out there, and yet you found a way to not only play out there, but to win out there. Man, I was just trying to hit the one closest to me, I swear. You know, I just got enough shots out there to build a little something. And, uh, the middle of the lane never looked good enough to move in. Feldman gets another strike. She's number two in the PBA Women's Series points ranking list and the money list, and her average is up and number one.
in the series. 216, last year was 208. And that is three in a row for Feldman, and the lead swells to 32. Say it with me, Mike. Tailbone! Hey, oh, man. <laughs> and on that, yeah, we thank you, Mike Machuga. <laughs> it was a pleasure, a good win. You may now go celebrate with somebody else besides us. Mike Machuga, thanks for joining us. He has won his second career Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour title in the final of the women's. When we return, Michelle Feldman in cruise control. And welcome back to ESPN's continuing live coverage of PBA action. This is the PBA Women's Series Women's Championship, and that is Michelle Feldman, who has just rolled four consecutive strikes, has a 42-pin lead as Jody Wessner steps up for her effort in the sixth. And the winner of today's Women's Series match will join Stephanie Nation, who won the first event on this tour, the Pepsi Viper Championship. We'll join them in the PBA Women's Series showdown in a season-ending dedicated broadcast on ESPN, sponsored by the United States Bowling Congress. Again, this is the second of seven PBA Women's Series events this season. Boy, there's a... Real obvious difference in power when you watch Michelle Feldman's bowling ball hit the pins and you watch Jody's ball hit the pins. Now, Jody must play the lanes much straighter because she's got a lower rev rate. That last shot leaving the week 10, you saw deflection. And again, I still think that Mike Machugo is spot on. She needs to still move a little bit further right on that lane. And although it looked like she rolled that shot pretty well, it just looked a pinch fast. So again, to get it up to the 1-3 pocket, a couple boards to the right, that same shot is going to find a home. Wessner, a process expert for the phone system at Owens Corning. She takes vacation days for those Thursdays. Friday, she actually worked because she's not too far from home here. Worked about four and a half hours, went home, and then drove out here. Got here at four, bowled at six on Friday, made the show. Drove back home, arrived at 3 a.m. and told us she was very thankful for the flexibility that Owens Corning has showed her to allow her to get on the PBA Women's Series Tour. And, and you know, it says in her bio that, that her biggest fear is bees and wasps. Yeah, you two went on and on about that yesterday. Michelle Feldman's biggest fear? Drowning. Neither one of them, please. Feldman leaves the 10. I don't want to get into your issue with bees and wasps and flies. Hey, Rob, let's talk about this, okay? Good. Uh, she leaves a week 10 here, and um, Michelle Feldman. No. Look out. She's already missed a single pin spare. Really? That's the second 10 pin she's missed in this match. But Michelle tells us that 31 time titleist Alita Sill drills all of her stuff and still coaches her. And that's the same coach that she's had since she came out on the ladies tour. Don't do stupid things. When she was 19, same Stop. coach all this time, still drilling her equipment. And she's battle tested bowling all of those events on the women's tour. Let's see if she can get herself back into this match. Should I say? recover from the open frame because she's well ahead in this match. Feldman finished second to Stephanie Nation at the Pepsi Viper Championship a few weeks ago in Omaha, Nebraska, losing 225 to 200. That was on November 2nd. Feldman's game, much like the men's, pretty powerful. Gets that hook on it. And a mock celebration on the spare conversion. You know, when, when I asked her, I, Michelle, you know, for the for the women in audience that are watching and watching you really hook that bowling ball, you know, what advice can you give uh, the women watching to, to, to get their bowling balls to hook more? She said, I, I don't know. I just do it. 
Yeah, she doesn't even know how she does it. You know, people ask her, hey, I, I want a bowl like you, Michelle. You know, wh what's your advice? She's like, well, I'm not all that sure how I even bowl. And if Jody Wessner wants to get into this game, she needs to continue to try and fall, follow your advice, which would be move right. She never got far enough. Remember watching Mike Bichugan where he played, remember the couple of shots that he threw that hit the one, two, three board just sucked right up to the pocket. I mean, you, you, you've got to have the experience behind you to, to look for that and to watch those matches and to give yourself an idea of where you're going to go. Down 32, she can only max out at 193. Michelle Feldman can top it at 225. Feldman rolled four consecutive strikes beginning in the third frame. Since then has gone open spare. But Jody Wessner had open frames in the second and the third and has rolled just one strike here in the title match. That looks good though. Well, she needs to strike out for 193. And then she would need to hope that Michelle Feldman ran into another open frame, but Michelle Feldman just fills frames in the ninth and 10th. She's gonna be in the 200s and she'll lock this match up. Feldman became the first woman to fire a 300 game on national television. And she did that against Carolyn Dorn Ballard, who's in attendance here today at the 97 Southern Virginia Open on the PWBA Tour, where she won 12 titles and was the 02 Player of the Year. Uh-oh. This could be the one opening that Jody Wessner needs and has been looking for if Michelle Feldman fails to convert 1 2 8 10. How about that? Massive pickup. Now just any mark in the 10th frame with good count, and she will shut out Jody Wessner. We've seen that made a few times, huh? Today. Yeah, that's what I was talking about today. You not listening to me again? No, I'm listening. Okay. It's just selective hearing with you. Uh, I understand. So Feldman's third spare of this title match. Four strikes and two open frames. Needs mark and count for the win. That's okay. A spare here. Really got to pick a spare to win, huh? And five. Give her 194. Best Jody Wessner can shoot. 193. Two. Fix it up. <laughs> Fun to watch when she gets it going, boy. She can throw a lot of strikes, and she played to her strength this week. And she said, you know, when we went into match play, Randy. It was just the women bowling on one side of the house, and I could move in, and I had the whole inside part of the lane to myself. Not two weeks in a row, no! He's got it. That's how you close out a title. Michelle Feldman, runner up in Omaha, wins it in Taylor. Wessner will roll out here in the 10th. She never got a look on the right lane, never moved far enough on the right lane. Sorry, Jody. I wish she could have thrown a couple of shots out there and, and, and got an idea of, of the, the friction that had been created. She'd have bowled a much better game. $10,000 will go to Michelle Feldman for winning the Chameleon Championship here as part of the PBA Women's Series. I don't want to practice 10 pins. Obviously, I can't pick them ever. Feldman will now join Stephanie Nation. 
who won the first event, the Pepsi Viper Championship in the PBA Women's Series Showdown. It's a season-ending show broadcast on ESPN and sponsored by the USBC. Now both of them finished strong. But it was Feldman beginning strong to get the victory. 199 to 173. Michelle Feldman wins the women's title. Mike Machuga takes it on the men's side. Machuga dropping Bill O'Neill in the final 209 to 204. Next week, we are back here at Taylor Lanes for the ultimate scoring championship. We expect some serious high scores with that one. For Randy Peterson and our entire crew, I'm Rob Stone. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.